Hi, um, I'm Emily Walsh, and I'm a Bates student in Sam Boss's first year seminar about Lewiston. Um, and this project is an oral history of COVID-19 in collaboration with the Lewiston Public Library so that people in the future can have access to just documentation of what was happening during these times. Um, and right now I'm speaking with Debbie Moran from Clover, Health Clover Healthcare, um, which is a nursing home in Auburn. And it's been pretty hardly hit by COVID from what I can tell. Um, and yeah, would you like to just talk a little bit about yourself before I start getting into the interview? Yeah. Um, as you said, I'm Debbie Mirren and I have worked here at Clover for about 14 years. Um, my primary responsibility is I am the activity coordinator on the long-term care dementia unit. Um, so um, it's um, very interesting and it's, and I, um, it is a passion of mine. Working with people struggling with dementia and their families is a passion. So it's been a privilege to work with them for the past 14 years. Wow, that's really impressive. Um, I guess I'll just get started with my first question. It's kind of broad, so just feel free to take it from whatever direction you want. But how has COVID affected both Clover Healthcare as an organization and also the, res the residents and the preschoolers? Because I really like the, the fact that you guys have a preschool yeah. on site. I think that's amazing. I've never heard yeah. of that. Yeah, the, um, we are just, to tell you a little bit about Clover, we are an aged place. Um, we have 278 um, beds. That means that, that we can have 278 people that live here. Um, we start at independence. People that come in here may have their own cars and completely independent. And then we go um, down to providing end of life care. Um, so, and along with that, we do have the preschool. Um, so we have a wide um, variety of people that call Clover um, their home. So one of the things that I think has really changed with COVID is the feel of the building. Um, we had a lot, it was always busy. There was just a lot going on. We had the preschoolers up here every day. Um, we had visitors in, we had pets in, we had volunteers, we had, we have a very strong um, activity department. We did a lot of activities. Um, so the building overall is much quieter right now. So as you know, as you can, you know, figure out that that leads to um, maybe some lack of cognitive stimulation, some isolation. So I think one of our biggest challenges at this point is just caring for the people that call Clover their home. Um, you know, we want to keep them healthy, both emotionally and physically. And that is a challenge in um, the best of times, but it's brought it to a whole new level now. Because while we're doing that, we also need to keep them safe and we need to follow CDC um, best practices guidelines. Um, so that is a real challenge. And the other challenge that goes hand in hand with that is when COVID first hit Clover, we had 21 um, staff that tested positive and five residents. Um, Clover was extremely proactive and we were COVID free in a very short period of time. Um, the staff just did amazing. But at that time, we had four, uh, 21 people that had to be out of work for 14 days. So that was a big chunk of our workforce. And then people left due to fear because at that time, COVID was even more scary than it is now because it was so much unknown about it. Um, they left because of their own personal health concerns. And the CARES Act was not healthcare friendly. Um, people, um, it was very tempting to stay home and care for your family and collect not only your weekly pay, but $600 a week extra. That is more money than most of these people have ever made in their life. So um, we lost a lot of staff and that Today, um, it, we still feel the effects of it. Just to give you an idea, we normally hire like 180 people um, positions in nursing. 
we are at 150 right now, and that goes up and down. So we're between 30 and 40 staff under just in the nursing department. Dietary stays between 12 and 15 under their staff. Um, they normally have 52, they have 40. And then you have to remember that on top of that, if there is any possibility of someone coming in contact, like if, say, you live with your brother and they have COVID, then you need to quarantine for two weeks. All the people that you've come in contact with, we need to quarantine a whole section of the building. And even though we have been extremely lucky, and I shouldn't even use the word lucky because it's really the hard work of everyone, um, that we haven't had COVID back in the building again, we have to be constantly vigilant while meeting those needs. Um, so even though our preschool director stayed open the whole time and she is still taking kids and during the thick of COVID, she um, took kids from the community as well as, you know, for essential workers. She was open for essential workers, but even that um, was not incentive enough um, when you had the CARES Act um, giving you such a big paycheck to stay home. So, um, wow. yeah. So and especially I, at a time when you would need so many more work, you'd think you'd need more workers now to be able to care for everybody. I don't know, it just seems really hard. Yeah, it was, you know, it, it, it was it was a very difficult time. And like I said, we still see the effects. And um, healthcare, and the, like I said, in the best of times, is just a really difficult um, profession to be in. It, it's not the highest paying wage. Um, and you work very hard. And the people that work here, I just have to say, they are the most dedicated people that I have ever met. Um, they just, they are the best. Mm -hmm. That's really sweet. Um, okay, my next question is, how have staff and residents adapted to this new normal of just, you know, a lack of people constantly in and out of their rooms and not being able to socialize as much. Um, and I'm sure also for the staff, they must be worried about getting themselves sick as well. Yes, and that, that is a real concern. And, um, you know, the residents, um, by the time they come to live with us, they have probably experienced in their lifetime many new normals. Um, you know, it's really difficult for them um, because they may have lost a spouse, their homes, their independence, declining health. So they have experienced all those losses and then they come to um, a congregate care setting and there may be a whole new set of losses. So now we have just brought it up to a whole new level because you come and live here, you make relationships, you make friends, and all of a sudden the dining rooms aren't open, there's no hairdresser, um, they have to stay in their rooms most of the time. So it definitely causes a great concern for isolation and like I said, um, decline in cognitive stimulation. And then staff concerns. I mean, you come in here, you have to get screened in daily, and just the feel is different. Um, you know, and then with the staff, they've got added responsibilities at home. You know, there may be um, economic issues, there may be relationship issues, and then on top of that, you're adding now they're responsible for their children's education, um, either by remote learning or, you know, or homeschooling or whatever they choose to do to educate their children. And just having children, you know, that brings another whole level of their children dealing with all of this um, lack of socialization. Um, so they're dealing with all of that. And then they come here and they are so committed to providing quality care for these residents. And I just can't say it enough because um, this staff just deserves so much recognition. And I think they get lost in the busyness of life sometimes because um you know they have a heavy load to bear sometimes yeah yeah um 
Okay, I'll move on to the next one. I keep forget. I feel like we have so much more time, but it's supposed to be like 20, 25 minutes interview. So. Um, my next one is how has Clover attempted to combat a sense of loneliness in the elderly since they're confined to their rooms? And I was reading this article about um, how hard it is for people with Alzheimer's in particular because mm. they might not know what's going on and why their family members have stopped visiting them. Do you get a sense of, like, do you think that's happening to them? Yeah, and you know, there's such, it, when you talk about the challenges and um, there's just, it's so wide because we service such um, a wide group of people. So, you know, um, of course, you know, and then the challenges all over the place. So the first one is that we're wearing masks and shields all the time. Oh, yeah. Human act interaction, just right off the bat, when you walk into a room, you they can't see your smile, they can't see your facial expression. So it's just really important right off the bat for our tone of voices, um, words of encouragement, affirmation, um, just you know that just to start that with, and that becomes even more important as you were saying with people with dementia, um, because they really communicate a lot with body language. Um, so there are things that we've done to, um, we use a lot of whiteboards for communication, maybe for our people that suffer with dementia so they can read it because they can't read our lips anymore. See, so we are always trying to create new ways of being able to communicate while um, dressed to keep us safe and them safe. Um, you know, and then we have safety concerns and we have CDC guidelines. And so we have all of these challenges. And of course, our number one, um, we want to keep people safe and we want to keep them. But while keeping them safe, we need to keep them healthy, both, like I said before, emotionally and physically, because isolation will cause physical decline. So some of the things that we've done, um, especially in the independence and some of the um, assisted living where um, they can be more independent, um, they have a lot, they have telephones. So they're able to communicate with phone by their family. Some of them actually have iPads themselves. And so they communicate that way. Um, we have in the nursing home, we have phones available um, at every unit. We have iPads available. Um, we had a local business that generously donated us iPads, so every unit is able to have their own iPad. Um, we do a lot of FaceTime, a lot of phone calls. We do um, window visits, which just started recently, and now that's another whole challenge with window visits because we need to balance the fact that a lot of people have a lot of visitors and some people don't have any. So it's our responsibility to meet the needs of um, all of the people that live here. So we have to try to balance that all of the time. Um, window visits can be a little challenging um, for people that struggle with dementia. Um, so um, we, we do them, but some people don't have them just because it's not, um, you know, it's not a quality of life of experience for them. So mm -hmm. their families understand that. Um, some people just like to come by and look in the window when I walk by with their loved one so they can actually put eyes on them um, to see them. If there's anything that breaks my heart is watching families have to interact with their loved ones this way. Um, it, that has got to be the most difficult part of the job. It's not working hard. It's not working with less staff. Um, it's not trying to be creative with the needs. It's watching families um, struggle with knowing that maybe this is the last time they're going to see their loved one and they're doing it through a window. That is the tough part of the pandemic. That sounds really difficult. Yeah. Especially because things kind of shut down so quickly. Yes. You know? So people didn't have any time to like process that they, they're from being in isolation or. Yeah. yeah. 
And you know, and of course, when you're dealing with human beings, there are lots of reactions to lots of things. And some people are very gracious and they'll be able to handle it more, where other people, it's very challenging for them to handle it. Um, so the staff has to also, um, you know, sort of try to, um, you know, meet the needs of everybody. Because when you're, when you're having a family visit, you want it to be good for everybody. Um, mm -hmm. So it's just another, um, it's just another challenge. Um, some of the positives though, we have a robust um, activity team. Um, we, um, Continuum, our company really believes in activities and Clover does. And um, the man that founded Clover all those years ago, Bill Gillis, um, set the model of having a lot of activity people because he truly believed, and this was way before it was a popular thing to do, that he truly believed that keeping residents engaged can um, just increase their overall well being and their wellness. So we have um, eight activity people here. We have a director and then we have seven staff. So that means that we can each have an area um, that we're responsible for. So that is a huge plus that we can actually be in our area. It's like I spend most of my day on the Galway unit, which is my unit, um, so that I can also help in a variety of other ways and being able to socialize with the residents at the same time. But it's just another um, presence in the building. Um, so some of the things that we have done is that because Clover staff, you know, I know that everybody, I'm sure, thinks their staff is the best, but Clover staff, Clover staff is just um, so incredible. And so there's a lot of socialization that goes on. I mean, we truly have become family in a whole new way now. Um, some of the things that we've tried to do that are different where we just got smart TVs for all the neighborhoods that didn't have them um, so that we can live stream more because our entertainers are um, offering that. We're trying to get prepared for winter. Um, just in like, I think it was later September, um, they, we were allowed to do some outdoor um, concerts so we were able to get a couple of those and you have to remember that the whole time we're doing all of this we have to clean the chairs before and after we have to have social distancing we have to have masks we have to follow all the guidelines so it takes so much longer um, to do that but we were able to do i think our highlight since March probably, has been that we were able to do a fall festival. Um, and we did it all outside with, like I said, social distancing, we set it up, but we had, we did a whole week long event. We had fried dough, we had cotton candy, we had miniature horses, we had an alpaca, we had a clown giving away balloons. Um, so it was really fun and it, and it just, it was fun. It just kind of added to it and we included staff um, in all of it. Um, so it was, it was a, a positive thing. So we're hoping to be able to continue to be creative in the ways that we meet the needs. We can have small groups now, as long as they're masked and social distance. Um, every area at Clover has been um, measured out so it tells us how many people we can have in that area um, so we are able to do some small groups now wow that's amazing i didn't know about the the carnival type thing but yeah it was awesome. fun it was fun yeah. we we do it every year but we usually do it outside and everyone hangs out so um we just had to be a little bit more creative with what we do yeah, yeah so um, we're like, I'm oh, sorry. No, I was just going to say the time is flying by, so I might have to like oh, combine sorry. my last two questions. <laughs> no, I, I, could, I could talk to you all day. I will, I will answer quickly. <laughs> and, okay, I'll, no, I'll do both. So one is, have residents been able to keep up their friendships with the preschoolers? Um, yes, they have been. When we were in the thick of it, they um, actually would do smile parades and they would go around and go visit and knock on the windows and have balloons and signs. And yeah, so that was right in the thick of when COVID hit. Um, you know, our preschool director was amazing and they're doing the 
have outdoor learning now, so residents can watch from their windows. They do dance parties in the street, um, in the driveway. And so um, we are doing the best we can. They have done some Zoom. Um, they're looking to do a costume parade around the building. So um, yeah, so we've done the best we can with the guidelines. Yeah, wow, that's awesome. I, I couldn't imagine that that would still be able to happen. That's I didn't even know that the preschool is still open when I like I couldn't tell from the website, but yeah, that's awesome. yes, they, have, they never close, so Kudos. wow, yeah, yeah, that's amazing. Okay, and then my final question is how can base students or other community members volunteer or just help out with Clover in some form? Um, as in, like, what are, what are Clover's biggest needs? Yeah. Well, as you know, everything has to be either virtual or yeah. um, at one point we couldn't accept anything into the building. We now can. We had um, a business that just gave us blankets and um, crosswords and, you know, crayons and I mean, uh, color pencils and just all kinds of goodies to keep the residents busy. So um, we can always use just, it's just fun to get a package. We split up the packages and then we brought them back to our individual areas and then we were able to open them up and it was just fun for them. So packages are always fun. Um, you know, support and connection, you know, anything virtually, um, you know, that is going on, we can always, um, now we can live stream it all. So um, just support and connections is what you can do. And just to understand that, you know, senior congregate care, um, it's probably never going to look the way it has in the past and um, things change daily. It's a new world. Um, we have to um, be very fluid all the time. So um, like I said, connection and support. Wow, that was amazing. Thank you so much for um, speaking with me. I'm going to end the recording now, but okay.